Good morning. And welcome as we gather for worship on this Lord's Day. I'm glad that you are here and we made it in. Isn't it wonderful that spring has sprung? Uh, I just love today. Um, it's not quite spring, but you know, it's all relative. It was so cold and now we're here in the warmth of double digits maybe even. Welcome to worship. Glad that you are here Guests, members alike, wonderful you're here. Remember that no matter where you are on your journey of life and faith, you're always welcome here at St. Andrew's, just as you're always welcomed into the loving embrace of Jesus Christ. As you came in, you were given a bulletin. The larger pages in that bulletin are our announcements. The smaller pages are, is the order of worship, and you can follow along. Uh, please note that there's a difference between page numbers and hymn numbers. So if, uh, knowing that, you'll be able to keep your place in worship. A couple things for announcements before we begin worship. It is pizza weekend, Super Bowl pizza weekend. Yesterday, 320 pizzas were made here uh, to support the youth going on uh, the mission trip and a trip to the Boundary Waters. If you ordered pizzas, these were pre-orders, if, if you ordered pizzas here at the church, please, 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 please pick them up today. Uh, if you ordered from an individual on their individual sheets, they will be delivering them to you. So, that's all I got for pizzas. If you got questions, there's a table in the back uh, by the kitchen. There'll be pizza sign back there and people to uh, help you there. Secondly, we're in the story. As many of you know, we're reading through Scripture, and a condensed version of Scripture, 31 weeks read from Genesis to Revelation. This morning, if you would like to be part of the discussion group after worship, please join the group in the north side of the fellowship hall here so you can watch a video and then discuss what you have heard and what you have read on this 16th week of the story. Please read the rest of the announcements that are in your worship folder so you know what's going on, knowing that you can take part in anything uh, that you would like to. I'd love to have you as involved as you would like to be. Those are all the announcements I need to make this morning. Once again, welcome to worship. Let's just take just a moment and quiet our hearts, particularly mine right now, I suppose, because I've been talking, but quiet our hearts and our minds and prepare to worship. For those who are able, I invite you to stand as we begin with confession and forgiveness, which is printed in the bulletin. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Let us come into the light of Christ, our conf confessing our need for God's mercy. Holy and faithful God, we so often choose our way instead of yours. We think we can evade your commandments. We have spoken in ways that kill, strayed with our hearts, betrayed friends, hated enemies, and embraced other gods. We have broken our promises. Search us deeply and create us anew. Lift the heavy burden of our sin and free us to follow your way of life. Call upon me, says the Lord, and I will answer. Our God has come among us to loose every bond and to set us free from all that weighs us down. Receive the forgiveness of all your sins in the name of Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Savior. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Together, let us pray the prayer of the day, which is printed in the bulletin. Holy One, heaven and earth reverberate with your glory, and humans and angels alike sing your praises. Open our minds to your breathtaking work in the world. Open our hearts that we might trust in you alone as you call us to follow, and then as you send us to spread the good news of Jesus Christ, our leader and rescuer. Amen. Please be seated. And at this time, if there are younger children here who would like to come forward, this is your time with Nikki. Come on up, everybody. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. Oh, thank you. They're going to face me this time. Is that okay with you guys? Cool? All right. So I have a question for you. What do you think is the difference between a want and a need? Yeah. What you want is like something that you want, you don't actually need it, like Coke. Okay, so you want Coke. But you don't need Coke. Okay, what else? What's another want? Uh, like, you want a toy, but you need water. You want a toy, you need water. Excellent, excellent. Anything else? Yeah. You want, like, certain clothes and certain toys, but you don't need them. Like, name brand clothes and stuff? Like, anything that warms you is needed, right? But a lot of times we want the cool stuff and... And sometimes even wants and needs are like in the things that we do. So like how many of you guys like to play video games? Is that a want or a need? Want. Okay. What about spending time with your friends and family? What's that? Just say it. You can go either way on that one, I think, because I think spending time with your family is probably a need. Yeah. And I don't know about you guys, but I need my friends. So I suppose if they're not very good friends, then it'd be a want, right? <laughs> okay, so if you are having wants and needs, how about priorities? Everybody say that with me. Priorities. What is a priority? Clothes. Clothes. Okay, so things that we need are the priorities, right? Okay, so bear with me here. We're going to pretend for a second this is your life. This is their life. Okay? So this is going to represent you. Okay? So you guys are going to help me out here. And I want you to say all those wants that you were saying just a little bit ago as I pour this rice into this jar and that's going to represent our wants okay so what were some of those wants playing video games what else toys, toys okay clothes. clothes all right money is that what you said yeah okay what was that pet. pets okay that's kind of a want yeah so things that aren't quite as important as the things that we need right so i put a bunch of our wants in here and it, it filled our jar at pretty high, so that means that if this is you and these are our wants, that means your time has taken up a lot of time with just wants, right? So I have these cool-looking, very old-looking blocks here. What does this say? Can anybody read that? These. Yeah. Do these blocks look a little bit old? Yeah. It's because they were mine when I was a baby. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to pretend these blocks are our needs. So our S is going to be friends and family spending time with friends and family. So let's put that in our jar, okay? And how about, what's something else we need? Nutrition, like exercise and taking good care of ourselves and eating good food? Yeah, okay, yeah. And what else do we need? School, doing our homework, things like that. That's kind of a good Eating's need, right? Awesome. Eating, okay, that's very good. Eating. All right, and I'm having some trouble fitting our needs into our jar here. I haven't talked about that jar yet. Shh, getting ahead of me. How about church and Sunday school? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hello. I was the first one. Yeah. It should have been the first one? Yeah. Well done. And, and then I'm going to say this one is maybe like, how about just God? Like prayer, taking time with God? Yeah. But here's the problem. See, we have so many wants in our jar that I can't even squeeze God in here, I don't think. But I have an idea. Remember that word I had you say a little bit ago? What was that? 
priority. Right. So our needs are priorities, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put our needs, our priorities, in this other jar that's also us first. So there went our Sunday school and our exercise and all those good things we just talked about, and especially our God, right? Now, we still have a lot of wants, but I wonder if because we were able to put our needs in first, if we could still have most of our wants. Let's see, shake it down a little. Well, looky there. Almost all of our wants still fit in our jar because we put our priorities first. We put our God first. We put our school first. We put our family and friends first. So we still get to have the things that we want, usually. But this really important stuff fit in there too, right? You get what I'm trying to say? Okay, cool. Let's pray. I'm to be with you. <laughs> you want to be friends with me? Okay, okay. let's pray. Dear God, Dear God. Thank, you thank you for helping us know what our priorities are. Thank you for friends and family. Thank you for our church. Thank you for love. In your name we pray. Ready? Amen. Good job. Thanks for coming up and seeing me, guys. The first reading is from 2 Kings, chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. If you're following in the Pew Bible, it's on page 345, and in the story on page 219. Though the prophets warned the people, the northern kingdom of Israel did not listen. About 150 years after King Ahab, the one we read about last week, a king by the name of Hoshea ruled in Israel, but as a vassal of the king of Assyria. And I was curious what present-day Assyria is today. Looking it up, it's northern Iraq, southeastern Turkey, and northeastern Syria. So a little different configuration today, but that's what it was at that time. A reading from Second Kings. In the twelfth year of King Ahaz of Judah, Hoshea, son of Eli, began to reign in Samaria over Israel. He reigned nine years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, yet not like the kings of Israel who were before him. King Shalmaneser of Assyria came up against him. Hoshea became his vassal and paid him a tribute. But the king of Assyria found treachery in Hoshea for he had sent messengers to King So of Egypt and offered no tribute to the king of Assyria, as he had done year after year. Therefore, the king of Assyria confined him and imprisoned him. Then the king of Assyria invaded all the land and came to Samaria. For three years he besieged it. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria, carried the Israelites away to Assyria, and placed them in Hala on the Habor, the river of Gozan in the city of Medes. This occurred because the people of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. They had worshipped other gods, 
walked in the customs of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. The word of the Lord. The second reading is from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 6. If you're reading in your pew Bible on page 622 and in the story 224. In the southern kingdom of Judah, the prophet Isaiah had come to prominence for his role in helping the king to stand down the Assyrian threat by relying on God alone. In this reading, we hear his call story, a reading from Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two They covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The privets on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, your sin is blocked out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. The word of the Lord. Our final reading is from the book of the prophet Isaiah again, chapter 49, and it's on page 666 of the Pew Bible and 227 of the story. Not even Isaiah could get the kings and the people to be fully committed to the Lord. Isaiah therefore prophesied that Judah would be conquered and the people taken away. But he also offered words of comfort, declaring that the time would come when they would return to Judah. God would not forget his people. A reading from Isaiah. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his suffering ones. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child or show no compassion for the child of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Your builders outdo your destroyers, and those who laid you waste go away from you. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather, they come to you as I live, says the Lord. You shall put all of them on like an ornament, and like a bride, you shall bind them. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who wait for me shall not be put to shame. Then all flesh shall know that I am the Lord, your Savior, 
and your Redeemer, the Holy One of Jacob. The word of the Lord. Please remain seated and join in singing on page 172, Holly, 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 Hallelujah. At a continuing education event that I went to at Luther Seminary a few years ago, the first verse of probably the best known psalm was repeated over and over again by those leading lectures and even in worship. And I'm guessing that many of you gathered here this morning know that first verse. When we repeated it at that continuing education event, it was like in a call and response fashion. Uh, the, the leader would say, the Lord is my shepherd, and the congregation or the class would reply, I shall not want. The Lord is is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Except we were using a little bit different translation, and it went like this. The Lord is my shepherd. I don't need a thing. The Lord is my shepherd. I don't need. The Lord is my shepherd. And when you think about that, that's a pretty radical statement, isn't it? It's spoken by someone who has experienced and been transformed by the love and presence of God to the extent that they know that nothing else really ultimately matters. Nothing else is more important than hearing God, following God, being obedient to God, and being used by God. Not family, not health, not finances, not career. As important as they all are, and they are, they pale in comparison to our relationship with God. The Lord is my shepherd. I don't need a thing. As chapter 16 of the story opens, we see a contrast between two kings. We have King Hosea up at the northern kingdom of Israel and King Hezekiah in the southern kingdom of Judah. King Hosea is being threatened by the superpower of the day, and that would be Assyria, as Nancy shared with us. They're about to be overrun and overtaken by Assyria. So what does Hosea do? He puts his trust in the no gods, those idols that the kings and the people of Israel, that northern kingdom, had embraced. He put his trust in trying to make alliances with Egypt. Everyone's always trying to make an alliance with Egypt, it seems to me. But he put his trust in those alliances. He put his trust in humans. Our text says of King Hosea and the people of Israel, they would not listen and were as stiff-necked as their ancestors who did not trust in the Lord their God. Israel was then defeated by the Assyrians, deported, if you will, by the Assyrians, and Israel would never be heard from again. King Hezekiah of the southern kingdom of Judah, takes a little different approach. Assyria is now standing on his doorstep, the doorstep of his kingdom, the southern kingdom of Judah. And they're ready to invade. And when you think about the history and their power and what is likely to happen, what's a king to do? Well, he didn't do as King Hosea of the north. 
he relied on. He leaned into, if you will. He cried out to God, saying, Now, Lord our God, deliver us from his hand, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord our God. Now, if you've been following the story at all, and if you haven't, you can always start. If you kind of lapsed a little bit, you can start again. But if you follow it at all, if you've listened at all, you might know, you might recognize something here. What we've been hearing all along is what Hezekiah understood. Hezekiah and his people were blessed not only for themselves, but so that the other nations of the world would hear, would observe, and be drawn to the God of Israel. As I just read, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. Even in, or perhaps especially in, uncertain, tough times, Hezekiah trusted The Lord is my shepherd. I don't need a thing. What about you? When the going gets tough, when things look bleak, what are you going to do? Can you trust God? Can you say the Lord is my shepherd? I don't need a thing. When times are uncertain, when it seems like you're about to be run over or overcome by your schedule or your lack of finances or lack of health or or whatever it might be, can you say and believe that the Lord is my shepherd? I don't need a thing. In the midst of Hezekiah's deliberations about the Assyrian threat on his doorstep, we're introduced to the prophet Isaiah. Last week, we looked at the greatest of the non-literary prophets. That would be Elijah. Today, it's the greatest of all the literary prophets, which simply means there's a book bearing Isaiah's name. Isaiah is the one who delivered God's response to Hezekiah's prayer, basically saying that things are going to be okay, Assyria will not defeat you. Assyria will not occupy you. Assyria will not deport you. And that came to pass. Now, as confident as Isaiah was in advising Hezekiah, it seems that he was lacking in faith or confidence either in himself or perhaps in God when God called him to serve as God's prophet. Our second Bible reading this morning From Isaiah chapter 6 is the call of Isaiah. In a vision, Isaiah saw the majesty and the awesomeness of God, which seemed to highlight just how far removed Isaiah was from all of it. And he cries out, woe is me. Nevertheless, God called him. All the uncertainty that can be involved and experienced when God calls. And I'm telling you this morning that God still calls people like you and like me. Calling us out of our comfort zones. Calling us from that which is familiar to that which is unfamiliar. From living relatively comfortable lives of being able to be, oh, I don't know, be silent to perhaps uncomfortable lives, of feeling compelled to speak a word of truth or a word of correction, perhaps, to our family or co-workers or friends. God calls us from the known to the unknown, from one career to another, from one place to another. My point is, God calls. What will you answer? Isaiah moved from, woe is me, To here I am, send me. A living embodiment of that verse, the Lord is my shepherd. I don't need a thing. Isaiah's task was not easy. As Judah fell back into idolatry, he had to share the word of the Lord that the people 
of Judah, like the people of the northern kingdom Israel, would also be taken away now. Another foreign nation, another superpower had arisen to replace Assyria. That was Babylon. Babylon would come and destroy Jerusalem would come and destroy the temple, would come and take their leading citizens back to Babylon. Can you imagine how tough it was for Isaiah to prophesy the complete destruction of Jerusalem? Can you imagine how tough it was for the people of Judah living in exile in Babylon for 70 years to say, the Lord is my shepherd, I don't need a thing? Hopelessness rather than faithfulness is what they felt like during those times of exile, during those dark times. In our third Bible reading from Isaiah 49, we hear their despair. The Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Have you ever felt like that? Like God has forgotten you? That God has abandoned you? That God has left you to your own devices? What then? Well, then what I would say is that we need a reminder. A reminder of God's presence and love. And our reading continues with such a reminder. God says, can a woman forget her nursing child? Or show no compassion for the child of her womb? Oh yeah, I guess they probably could forget. And yet, I will never forget you. I will never forget you. It might seem like it from time to time. Maybe you've been in one of those times where it seems like God has forgotten you. Maybe you are in one of those times when it seems like God has forgotten you. Maybe it's been, you've been in that situation for quite some time already where it feels like God has forgotten you because life can be so tough. Life can be difficult. Life can be lonely. What then? Well, like I said, we need a reminder We need a reminder that God has not forgotten us. As we gather for worship like we have this morning, we get reminders. In the name of Jesus, I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. A reminder. The body of Christ given for you a reminder, the blood of Christ shed for you, a reminder, you are not forgotten. Perhaps the greatest reminder for us, even in the midst of our struggles, comes at the very end of chapter 13 of the story. We didn't read it this morning but it's also from the prophet Isaiah. You see, more so than any other place in the Old Testament, Isaiah gives us, the readers, a glimpse of what we've been calling the upper story, a foreshadowing of how that upper story, God's story, will unfold. In Isaiah, you see, we catch a glimpse, just a glimpse of Jesus At the end of this chapter 16 of the story, we read, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds, we are healed. We often hear those verses on Good Friday as we ponder Jesus' death on the cross. 
And what a reminder it is for, for those of us living through tough times. What a reminder of the one who loves us so much that he came to be among us as one of us and whose love was so deep that he endured everything that humanity could throw at him and he died on the cross. It was out of love for you. It was out of love for me. You see, Isaiah is giving the people of Judah, living in exile now, some foreshadowing. And Isaiah is giving us, as we are gathered here this morning, a reminder of the depth of the love of God, of the depth of God's compassion for each one of us. So that in particular, in those uncertain times, in those difficult times, in those times when it may seem like it, God has forgotten us, or perhaps in those times when God is calling out, whom shall I send? We can proclaim, we can answer in faith, even if we don't exactly feel like it every moment of every day. We can proclaim in faith, the Lord is my shepherd. I don't need a thing. The Lord is my shepherd. Amen. <laughs>